I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Mayan Levy. Mayan is an assistant professor of microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania, where her lab studies the communication between the microbiome and its host, with a focus on the gut microbiome and its relationship to diet, immune system function, and disease. We discussed a variety of topics, including her recent study linking the ketogenic diet to lower risk of colon cancer, what the ketogenic diet is, and what the metabolic state of ketosis does in the body, molecules called ketone bodies, such as BHB, and the extent to which BHB supplementation can recapitulate some of the physiological effects of the ketogenic diet, how the microbiome influences the function and development of the immune system, and the hygiene hypothesis, the idea that modern human cultures may be too clean or too heavily reliant on antibiotics and other types of technology that actually interfere with our microbiome in ways that may be detrimental to metabolic and immunological health. If you're interested in health and diet, generally speaking, and in the microbiome and the immune system in particular. This is a very interesting episode. I did not know too much about the ketogenic diet or the metabolic states it induces and how those can be linked to different disease states and things like that. So if you're into any of that stuff, I think this is a really fascinating topic with a researcher who's who has just recently put out a lot of new work um, looking at this new scientific work. So this is really uh, cutting edge stuff that we discussed. As always, if you enjoy the content of this podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. You can share your favorite episodes with friends and family. You can also sign up for my free weekly Mind and Matter newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com. I also post some other long-form content there from time to time based on the topics covered on the show. And you can find all of the different versions of the podcast, links to the audio and video versions, and different things at that Substack. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day and it's super convenient if you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter athletic greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin d and five free travel packs with your first purchase their vitamin d product comes in tincture form so you just take one drop each day a large fraction of the population is actually vitamin d deficient especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure and vitamin d is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things and there's even even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Mayan Levy. Dr. Mayan Levy, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Can you start off by just telling everyone who you are and what your lab works on, what kind of what kind of science that you do? Sure. So I am an Israeli scientist. I I was born in Israel and I was trained in Israel. Um, I did my master's and my PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science um, in the lab of Elan Elinal, um, studying the microbiome. I came to the University of Pennsylvania in 2018. And I've opened my lab in the microbiology department. And generally, my lab is interested in in studying questions that are related to the microbiome, intestinal immunity, how the communication between the gut and the bacteria is happening. Um, So we are are mainly focused in the gut and how this kind of interaction is influencing different human diseases. Um, Yeah. And um, how did you get interested in that general subject? Were you, were you always studying this or were you studying something else and then kind of got into this? Um, so I think that's, you know, we, 
about like 10 years ago, there was a major focus and, and a shift into the microbiome. And I think this mainly happened because, you know, we understood that uh, our genomes cannot explain everything. There are diseases and different conditions that cannot be explained by alterations of, of our genome. So there must be something else. And this something else is our microbiome. And if you are thinking about the gut, then the, actually the number of genes that are, are contributed by bacteria are much larger than the amount of genes that are contributed by, by us, by the host. So the the microbiome is, has been over these past years shown to be relevant in basically any aspects of, of human physiology and, and human disease. So now you can connect the microbiome to almost any disease from neurological diseases, cancer, aging, um, different metabolic diseases, lung diseases, and, and like basically everything. So we know that the microbiome is super important for many, many aspects of our lives. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean that that makes a lot of sense. Um, just you know, when you think about how how numerous uh, these microbes are in terms of the number of cells and the number of genes, yeah. it really does make a lot of sense. And and it's you know, not just the number; it's also how close they are. So if mm. you are thinking about the gut, the the amount, the, this huge amount of bacteria that we all have inside of us is like is located so close to what we know and need to maintain as sterile tissue. So they 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 are so close. So they you know they we are sensing them constantly. We have to constantly react and respond to their presence. But on the other hand, we need to make sure that we don't constantly have an inflammatory condition and a constant response towards these bacteria. Yeah. So that means you know it's very interesting. On the one hand, you have to have this sort of exquisite sensory system to de constantly detect and identify these microbes, and yet it somehow has to discern that they are not bad or not always bad so that we don't have this constant sort of immune reaction. Yeah, exactly. And so this, I think that the way I see it, the major cell, cell type that is mediating this protection or sensing is the intestinal epithelial cells. If we're focusing on the gut, obviously there are microbes outside of the gut, basically everywhere that our body is exposed to the environment, the skin, the lung, um, the reproductive tract, but my focus is in the gut, so I can I can say that the cell type that I think mediates this interaction is intestinal epithelial cells. These are the cells that line the 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 gut. So they, they are the cells that see the microbes and what they produce first. Um, and if you're thinking about sensing mechanisms, by now we know that there are several types and several families of receptors that can sense the presence of bacteria. And during my PhD, I actually worked on one of these sensing platforms that is called the inflammasome. Um, and I worked specifically on an inflammasome that is called NLRP6. It is called NLRP6 because the, the sensing component to it is an NLR protein that is called NLRP6. So we call it the NLRP6 inflammasome. And this was discovered back in 2012 by my uh, PhD mentor. Uh, Dr. Rani Linav, and what he found is that this specific inflammasome is expressed in epithelial cells in the gut, and that in the absence of this sensing platform, the, the mice develop an abnormal microbiome composition or a dysbiotic microbial composition. And more interestingly, what he found is that this microbiome made the mice more susceptible to different inflammatory diseases. Mm -hmm. IBD, but also diabetes and even colorectal cancer. I see. Um, so if you if you, if you knock it out, if there is no sensing, the microbiome becomes abnormal. The composition is not what it used to be. It's not. It doesn't look like a healthy composition, and the function of bacteria, more importantly, is altered as well. I see. So if you if you disrupt the ability of the cells lining the gut to actually sense the bacteria that are present, they presumably can't figure out which bacteria are which. Exactly. And, and the general consequence of doing that, if you completely disrupt it, is the microbiome composition is different and you're more susceptible, at least rodents are more susceptible to all kinds mm -hmm. of different diseases. True. Yeah, that's exactly this. And so this was the basically the initial observation. What we then did in subsequent studies to show exactly how it happens. We found that the microbes 
can influence the, the activity state of this sensing platform. And downstream to the sensing platform, there is secretion of inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-18. And we found that downstream to these cytokines, there is a transcriptional program inside intestinal epithelial cells that leads to a secretion of antimicrobial peptides. And when you disrupt this, you disrupt the, the, the secretion of these small peptides that are antimicrobials. And if you don't have these antimicrobials, then the community of bacteria goes wild. I see. So, so there are systems that these cells are connected to, which probably regulates the type of anti, like natural exactly. antibiotics, basically, yeah. that our body yeah, makes. Yeah, exactly. And how much we're making. And if you disrupt yeah. that, you make too much or too little or the wrong ones, it just screws up what kind of bacteria are actually present. Exactly, exactly. So you, you shift the balance somehow when it becomes abnormal and more likely to develop different intestinal diseases. And to what extent, so when we think about the body's internal ability to sense and identify bacteria, how much of this are we born with? Like how much of the knowledge is innate and how much of it has to be learned as a uh, development is happening? Um, so we are mainly focused on the innate immune system that we are born with. I don't think it needs to be trained, but if you're thinking about the, you know, the coevolution of, of bacteria and, and the human host or mice, um, then we are born sterile and then we acquire the bacteria. Um, so I, as far as I know, there is no activation of this sensing system in you know before we are born when we are sterile and then after we are born and we acquire the first bugs then we start sensing and reacting and maybe learning what we need to respond to and what is a friend i see and so there's this distinction between the innate and the adaptive immune system that gets made in immunology can you just sort of explain what that is for people at a very basic level yeah so the the immune system is divided into two main arms, the, the adaptive immune system and the innate immune system. When we're talking about the innate immune system, uh, we talk about uh, receptors that can detect different molecules. Um, and they, they, these receptors, they, we all have the same ones. They don't undergo any uh, recombination in contrast to receptors of adaptive immune cells, uh, mainly B and T cells. Um, so what we are born with is what we have. We, there is no, uh, okay, generally uh, it's thought that the innate immune system doesn't have any memory capacity in contrast to an adaptive immune system or an adaptive response. In, you know, if you challenge with a pathogen that is uh, then the adaptive immune system will respond. And then in a secondary challenge, the response will be even larger or more robust. This is something that doesn't happen when, when something is sensed by the innate arm. Um, um, so it's a, it's a more uh, basic maybe, or more uh, um, the primitive. The responses are stereotyped. Yeah, maybe more primitive uh, response. I see. So in general, I mean, there's probably a lot of complexity and caveats there, but in general, right? So we're, we're sort of born with this innate immune system. It's the part that like is basically encoded in the genome. It's sort of ready, ready to roll. Um, mm -hmm. It's hardwired. And then, um, so that 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 is part of the sensing mechanism for how these gut epithelial cells in the linings of the gut are sensing the identity of the bacteria. And so what, what about the bacteria do we sense? Like how does the body tell a bacteria mm -hmm. from a, a human cell? I think that the question is even more interesting than the, the question that you are asking now. How can this system distinguish between good bacteria and bad bacteria? Yeah, interesting. It, because if you're thinking about these, so these sensing receptors, they can be either on the membrane of the cells and sense the basically the gut lumen or they can be in the cytoplasm of the cells and then they will send something that will enter and and can be recognized inside the cells if you're thinking about recognition of bacteria by these kind of receptors then there are, i think we need to make a distinction between commensal bacteria and pathogenic bacteria so if you're thinking about the gut then we have the the line of epithelial cells and they are inside the lumen, inside our tube. There is feces and, and the bacteria inside it. 
But in between epithelial cells and the, the fecal matter, there is a, a layer of mucus. And generally this mucus layer is preventing bacteria from, from getting really close to our epithelial cells. Um, so commensal bacteria, they usually cannot penetrate and get physically uh, very close to epithelial cells. We have this, this border. Pathogenic bacteria, on the other hand, they have mechanism, mechanisms uh, through which they can penetrate this, this mucus layer and get physically connected and, and physically really close to epithelial cells. So they can be sensed through a physical interactions. I think that when we're thinking about commensal bacteria, the, the, gut, the bacteria that we all have in our gut and are not necessarily considered pathogenic, um, then we're talking about these, these bugs that cannot get really close. So we need to be able to sense something that is more likely being secreted by mm -hmm. these bacteria. So it can, it can be secreted from bacteria and, and get closer and, and even enter intestinal epithelial cells. So when we're thinking about this, we can we mainly call these um, small molecules metabolites. So these metabolites, microbial metabolites can be sensed as well. I see. So so I'm imagining uh, I'm imagining a, a, a system here, an ecology where so so you said you've you've got the lining of the gut and then you've got bacteria, but they're not touching generally exactly. the lining of the yeah. gut. There's yeah. this protective mucus layer, literally physically uh, you know, protecting and, and creating a, a barrier between those two populations, our cells and the bacteria cells. And if I'm hearing you correctly, the difference between a, a pathogen, something that's bad for us, and commensal bacteria, which is not, isn't necessarily like an intrinsic difference between them. It's simply whether or not they get too close. So, so could good bacteria even be bad if they somehow, if that mucus layer breaks down or something like that? Yeah, exactly. So there are cases where commensal bacteria or the bacteria that we consider good, they can become more pathogenic um, and other, under conditions where it's, it's many conditions that our immune system cannot recognize them and not, cannot maintain this balance with the antimicrobial peptides and the cytokines that are being secreted and antibodies that are being secreted into the lumen. And under these conditions where the immune system is, is breached, then we can, these commensals can become pathogenic. The, the difference between commensals and pathogens is one of them is the, the location in, you know, in relation to epithelial cells, but it's not the only difference. Pathogenic bacteria have uh, all kinds of toxins and different factors that they can secrete into the cells. They have different machineries to, that allow them to become pathogenic and, and cause a disease. Commensals do, usually do not have these, these programs. So, so you've got this mucus layer sort of protecting the body, not letting, not letting any of these bacteria get too close. And there are different things, different molecules that these bacteria secrete. Some of those are sensed by the cells of the gut. Is there any, are there any general patterns as to what kinds of molecules are being sensed? Like what are, are these things, what, what kinds of things are they? So I think it's the, the million dollar question. Uh, we know that in the gut, there is a huge, huge amount of these small molecules or metabolites. And uh, the function and the identity of the majority of them is completely unknown. We don't know what exactly they are. We don't know exactly how they're being sensed. We don't know what happens downstream or after these molecules are being sensed. But over the last few years, we, we and others have studied studied few of these examples, few of these metabolites in great detail. And now we understand that some of these microbial metabolites can be sensed by different parts of the innate immune system or different immune cells. And downstream to them, many things can happen. So if um, short chain fatty acids that are the, the uh, ferment, fermentation product of fibers that are fermented by bacteria. We cannot uh, metabolize these kind of, of uh, molecules. Um, then they can downstream lead to uh, secretion of, of different immune, um, different cytokines. Uh, the, the function of, of many of the, these metabolites, again, is, is completely unknown. Um, we found specifically uh, during my PhD, a few of these metabolites that can activate an immune response and other metabolites that can suppress the immune response through the, um, the inflammasome complex that I've mentioned before. So some of these metabolites can, can 
activate or support an immune response and some will dampen an, an, an immune response. But again, the majority of, of the metabolites is completely unknown. I see. So, so things are mostly unknown here, but there's at least two very broad classes of molecules that seem to be at work here. One are molecules that we sense in order to regulate the immune response, either turn it up or turn it down. Mm -hmm. And then presumably a lot of these things are actually directly ingested as nutrients as well. Is that, is that true? Yeah, that's exactly true. So the, the, in addition to the, you know, the regular function or the function that we would first think of when we think about bacteria, which is processing and digestion of food uh, and, and uh, different, different um, molecules that can be produced as a result. Uh, we, we can sense, so maybe let's phrase it differently. We can sense uh, breakdown products of food that we eat. These products are either being digested by us, by ourselves, or by bacteria. And we can also sense these small molecules that are indicators of some microbial activity, and they are from a microbial origin. So if we think about different you know, components of bacterial cell wall or different uh, I don't know, metabolic products of, of bacteria that tells us, hey, now there is a very active microbial community you need to do something about it. Maybe you need to secrete many of these antimicrobials to, to reduce their numbers. Maybe they're getting too close to us, to, to the cells. Maybe we should you know, produce more mucus to, to push them a little further away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did want to ask you more about that mucus layer. Um, it's, it seems very important, obviously. I imagine that there are people and animals that can be put into situations where they're making too much or too little. What are, are there any, are there any disease states that maybe people will be familiar with that involve problems with that mucus layer? Yeah. So, so one, one example is, is inflammatory bowel disease. Um, you can, you can have a reduce production of mucus. This enhances the, the inflammatory state in the gut. If there is less mucus, then bacteria can get closer mm -hmm. and it enhances the immune response. Um, so any, basically almost any inflammatory condition in the gut can have some kind of alteration in mucus secretion. Um, some bacteria can degrade mucus, uh, which makes the, the situation a bit more complex even. And you know, one of the things that's interesting here, so, so there's two things I want to discuss in terms of things that we put in our bodies that are probably changing the microbiome composition. One is diet and the other is antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So let's just take those one at a time. And can, so you, can you just talk a little bit, broadly speaking, um, about how, how sensitive the microbiome and its composition is to what we eat? If you shift your diet in any significant way, how how sensitive is that microbiome going to be to that? Very sensitive. So the microbiome receives many environmental signals. One of these environmental signals or life, lifestyle signals is diet. So when we shift our diet to a different diet, the microbes will change. They, you know, the microbes see what we eat. They metabolize it. They they uh, they grow or they die in response to it, so that the composition composition definitely changes. Um, you you know there there are many cases in which people you know they travel to different countries, their microbiome shifts, but then when they will return return to their uh, uh, country of origin, then they will go back to their lifestyle and the microbiome will gradually shift back. Um, so it's it's. We can say that genetics influences the microbiome and the composition, but it's also diet and lifestyle. And this factor in contrast to genetics is, is something that we can, we can influence. Um, antibiotics deplete the microbiome. Um, there has been a study from the Elinav lab from a couple of years ago that shows that uh, following antibiotics treatment, um, if you give probiotics, it takes even longer for the original composition of the microbiome to return, um, and to, to recolonize. Um, yeah. So yeah, say, say more about that. So you're saying 
use antibiotics, you sort of wipe out or deplete significantly the microbiome. And then people these days are often now using probiotics to replenish it, but you just said it takes even longer when you use probiotics in these cases to replenish the old yeah, population. There are, yeah, there are some cases where um, they've shown that people that, that took probiotics, um, it took them even longer to, to get back to their pre-antibiotics state. Um, are they basically consuming the wrong antibiotic, <laughs> the wrong probiotic and putting the wrong bacteria in there? That's a good question. So I, I'm not a probiotics expert, but if you think about probiotics, so I think one of the main questions is, are you actually putting something that is live into you and whether this you know, bacteria that's supposed to be alive if you bring them into your gut, into you know, an environment that already has bacteria in it, will they manage to survive? Um, in the case of antibiotics, the situation is a bit different because you deplete the existing microbiome and you make an, you know, an emptier niche for probiotics mm -hmm. to grow. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I would, you know, every time I would take antibiotics, I would immediately take probiotics to bring back the good bugs because you know i i don't think there is you know one one recipe that fits all my microbiome is different than yours uh we you know we don't necessarily need the same bugs i think that you know something that is a bit less aesthetic is fecal microbiome transplantations and then you recolonize your own gut with a sample of of stool basically that was taken before you started taking antibiotics. So you bring back your own microbes. This is something that is done, you know, in a clinical setting, um, obviously not something that can be recommended to uh, individuals at home. I see. Now, if you, you know, sometimes people take, you know, fairly large doses of antibiotics because they get sick and they have a particular use case for it. But also, you know, my understanding is we're probably all chronically exposed to some sort of background level of antibiotics more or less all of the time, just from it sort of being so widely used in modern society. Is there any understanding of how different our microbiome composition is because of that sort of environmental feature? Um, do our microbiomes resemble... Um, what they would look like if if we didn't have so much use of antibiotics. So you're talking about environmental exposure to antibiotics? Yeah, yeah. That is coming, for example, through the meats that we consume? Yeah, I think it comes um, from the food supply. I think, you know, e e people even detect it in water. Like it's, it's sort of, yeah. there's like this background level of antibiotics sort of everywhere, it seems. Um, That's a good question. I, I, I'm not aware of any studies that... That specifically addresses this question. Uh, one way to test it in, at least in, you know, in animal models, would to expose them to a very, very low level on of antibiotics for a really long time, and then look at their microbes. I maybe it's if it's a, you know, the the dose is is too low to cause microbial killing, but it is enough in order to enhance the growth of others. And no, okay, no, I will cancel this. I don't think, uh, I, I'm not sure if, if you would be able to even answer this question. Got it. Got it. So let's say, let's say someone takes, um, you know, a dose of antibiotics because they get sick. So they have a particular, um, need to take the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. They recover in that window where the microbiome is depleted. Is there any increased susceptibility to different diseases developing in that window? I would think that there is an increased susceptibility to other infections. So one of the main functions that, that our microbiome is, is providing is colonization resistance. So by having this you know, huge community in our gut, whenever there is a pathogen, it, it, you know, the, it's the first thing that this pathogenic bacteria would see. So they... Mm -hmm they would compete on nutrients and space. And when you deplete it by, by using antibiotics, you basically free the niche. Now there is you know, much higher availability of food and, and more space to grow. So a pathogenic bacteria can grow more. So, I, so yes, it's uh, 
it enhances the susceptibility or increases the susceptibility to secondary infections. Mm -hmm. What about, so there's this thing called the hygiene hypothesis. What, can you explain what that is for people and just talk about like, is that, do we think that there's good evidence for that? And, and what do you think that means? So, yes, I think that the, so the hygiene hypothesis is mainly linked to, to allergy um, and, and diseases that we, that it's thought that we would normally not have if we would be exposed to bacteria. This theory says that in, in modern society and, and our current lifestyle, we, you know, we, we are much cleaner, we are less exposed to bacteria, so we are, less, we are more prone later on in our life to develop allergies towards different components that otherwise we would have exposed, been exposed to earlier in life and develop a an protective immune response against. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I think it's definitely true. I think that our, you know, in our current lifestyle, we, we pay much more attention in, to, to hygiene and definitely compared to, you know, hundreds of years back. Um, this influences the development of the immune system and susceptibilities to different diseases, including allergies later on. But not a, I'm not an, an allergy expert at all. I see. But so, so the basic idea is, you know, the hygienic practices we regularly engage in the modern world, you know, literally physically cleaning our bodies, um, wiping down surfaces, using disinfectants, yeah. using antibiotics, it's probably having some kind of effect on the microbiome and just yeah. the, the microbial world around us. Yeah. And, and our immune response as a result. I see. And, but you said there, there is good evidence that that is linked to potentially the development of asthma. Yeah, exactly. And, and allergies. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so what about, um, what about like the subject of autoimmunity as it relates to the microbiome? So I, I've gotten the impression from, from looking at things that, um, the microbiome is, is somehow connected to certain autoimmune diseases, at least. And if autoimmunity is the state where the body's basically confused about cell cellular identity and starts attacking its own healthy cells, how does this sort of um, detection and discernment mechanism of the immune system start to tie into the microbiome? And, and when does it start to get confused and lead to autoimmunity? So the... I think the question in, in autoimmune diseases is what exactly do you recognize? So you can, if you think about the microbiome as this additional organ that you have, you can even view different inflammatory diseases like IBD as, as autoimmune diseases. And you can, in this case, you recognize or you you have a problem in recognition of, of some microbial components. So this is one thing. The other thing is, is autoimmune diseases that, um, that are driven by, by, by different components of our cells. And then they, these kinds of cells will be attacked by our own immune response. So we will recognize them as something foreign while we actually need to, uh, to recognize them as self and not mount an immune response against them. So in autoimmune diseases, the, the body is confused or the immune, the immune system is confused and it reacts when it shouldn't be reacting or towards something that it shouldn't recognize as foreign. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, so what you're saying is kind of interesting. So in a case like, let's just say type one diabetes, you know, your immune system starts attacking some cells in your pancreas, which are important for um, blood sugar regulation and they get destroyed. And, and the result of that is diabetes. But just like the pancreas is an organ of our body and it's, I mean, it literally is, it's made of cells with our genome. You're saying that one way you might think about the microbiome is it's the population of bacteria that live in our gut and elsewhere. And even though they're, they're not us in the sense that they have a different genome, it's sort of like another organ. And mm -hmm. we want to be unconfused about the identity of that in the context of the immune system so that we don't attack the good bacteria say. And, and so some, something, something like that can happen. Yeah. Okay, Interesting. Yeah, so what, um, so what, uh, 
I mean, are, are some of these things like IBD and some of these gut health autoimmune issues, my understanding is that they're getting more common over time, at least in, in the US. Is that, is that true? Yes, it's, it's true. I think that this is, you know, these, these kind of diseases that are greatly influenced by our diet and lifestyle. And this is something that has changed over the last few decades dramatically. Um, you know, we, we eat different kinds of foods, we exercise less, we completely changed our lifestyles, um, and susceptibility to different diseases changed accordingly. Um, yeah, one, if you think about higher susceptibility for cancers in, in the GI tract, mm. you can, if you look at the trajectory, you, you can clearly see that there is a um, a very clear increase over the last few years. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't think that, you know, our genomes did not change so rapidly. So it's something that we, either the lifestyle that changed or something in our lifestyle that affects the, the rate of acquiring new mutations that then increases susceptibility to different intestinal cancers. I see. So, so something's going on though, where in the gut, certain diseases, where the, whether it's something inflammatory like IBD or even cancers, as you just mentioned, are, are going up over time. So, so something's going on down there. Mm -hmm. um, I know that one of the things you've looked at recently had to do with colon cancer and how it's influenced by um, certain, certain aspects of diet. So can you describe what the basic, the basic uh, thing was that you studied there? Sure. So I, I can tell you first why we even looked mm. at colorectal cancer. Um, so in, in most of the cases of, of colorectal cancer, at something like two thirds of the cases, there is no known genetic mutation that mm. is, uh, you know, is driving these kind of cancers. So we, we think that in contrast to a specific gene that is mutated, there are other factors, including environmental factors or lifestyle, that can uh, make us more or less susceptible to developing colorectal cancer. And if we're thinking about specifically in the case of colorectal cancer, then one of these, um, these lifestyle factors that was associated to CRC development is diet. And in, in multiple studies, it was shown that different kinds of diets make us more likely to develop colorectal cancer. And these diets include diets that are very rich in, in uh, sugar, mm. uh, Western diet, um, and even consumption of, of red meat, and specifically proteins and, and uh, proteins that come from, from an animal source like red meat. Um, but from, from these kinds of studies, we basically know we, what we should avoid. We don't know if there is any specific diet that will protect and not make us more likely to develop cancer. So the, the project that you mentioned started from this question of whether we can find a diet that will be protective from colorectal cancer or, or even could be used as a treatment for colorectal cancer. Hmm. Yeah, so this was the, this was the beginning and, and the main question that we had in mind. This is, yeah, it's really interesting just the idea of using diet or exploring diet as a potential treatment for certain diseases. And I want to dig into that, but um, let, why don't we start out by just describing for people, what is the diet that you looked at and, and what is the diet? Yeah. Like, like what, yeah. what's it composed of? So we, we work in a lab setting, so we could design diets that were matched in their, um, their different components and other components we could change. So we had controlled uh, controls and, and we could use uh, um, diets that we specifically designed. So we designed six different diets and these diets had constant protein levels and they only varied in their fat to carbohydrates ratio to the mm -hmm. basically fat to sugar ratio. Um, and what we found, so we, we fed mice these six different diets, and then we induced colorectal cancer in a few different models. So we have in the lab the ability to, to make or to, to have the mice develop colorectal cancer. 
And these mice were fed the six different diets, and then we looked at the consequences. And so, what we so found, you can just you can just get like turn on colon cancer in certain mice. Yeah, there how, are ways. Yeah, how does how does that work? So there are a few ways to do it. Uh, you can you can induce colorectal cancer uh, by using uh, transgenic mice or mice that have uh, mutations in tumor suppressor genes. And you can induce colorectal cancer by a more inflammatory uh, mechanism uh, by injection of a carcinogen and then uh, inducing inflammation. So it will be an inflammation uh, derived cancer. Um, so there are a few ways they vary in their duration and uh, slightly the outcome, uh, the size of the tumor. So, but at least in, in this particular project, we we used all the available uh, models that we had. So it, it, the, the observation that we had could be verified across different models. Uh, so, so what was the, so you, you had these six different diets, all protein matched. They basically only differ in the sh- ratio of, of carbs or sugar to yeah. fats. Mm-hmm. And you've got these different models of colon cancer, these different, um, uh, types of mice that are susceptible to colon cancer. So you induce cancer in these mice um, in each of the groups getting each of the different diets. And what was what was the basic result? So we we could follow the mice um, at different time points because we have in our lab a mouse endoscope. So we can perform colonoscopies on these mice and and follow the, the progression of tumors uh, throughout the experiment. Um, And what we found is that the mice that were fed the diet that were very rich in fat and very low in carbohydrates, they hardly developed any tumors. And the tumors that they did did develop were significantly smaller in size. Um, And if we just look at the the fat content of the diets that we used, the the percentage of fat varied between 0.3 all the way to 90% fat. Uh, and we found this protective effect in the diet that had 90% fat. Nine, and 90, nine, zero. Nine, zero. Yeah. And these diets are called ketogenic diets. Um, and I'm sure uh, many, uh, many uh, people now know uh, it became uh, a very popular diet over the last few years. Um, and these ketogenic diets, they are very, very high in fat and they are low in carbohydrates. Um, they have enough proteins and, and calories. And, and these kind of diets were um, originally developed in the 1920s as a, as a treatment for epilepsy. And hmm. specifically in kids that didn't respond to uh, regular medications, they were put on a ketogenic diet. And in the majority of the cases, it significantly improved the outcome in these patients. Hmm. So you find this interesting effect with tumors when you're having a ketogenic diet, 90% plus fat, mm-hmm. you have this sort of anti-tumor effect in mice. Ketogenic diets used to treat epilepsy. So something interesting is going on. What actually, so when you're, when you're consuming a genuine ketogenic diet, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you know that physiologically what's going on in, in the metabolic processes of the body that, that changes? So a ketogenic diet is called ketogenic because it indu- induces the, the production of ketone bodies in our body. And ketone bodies are small. Um, they are molecules that are derived from fat and they provide energy to tissues when glucose is not available. So when you consume ketogenic diet, the level of glucose is really low because we consume less sugars. Um, and then different organs in our body, including the brain, they, they need to get their energy somewhere. So some of the, of, the, of the tissues in our body, they cannot get enough energy by just metabolizing fat. They cannot metabolize fat and they need to have this alternative source of, of energy. And our bodies and specifically our liver can take these fats and by, uh, by different um, mechanisms and, and um, oxidation processes, these fats can be converted and made into ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies can now go all the way to the brain 
and give the brain enough energy in in these cases where glucose is is not available. So these are very these are compounds that are very um, energy rich and they provide energy to these other places when when glucose is is not available. I see. So when when sugar is not in abundance, the body needs to get energy from somewhere. That energy is stored up in this fat, but it's not it sounds like it's not in like the best format for all the cells of the body. Yeah. So the liver turns the, some of the fat into ketone bodies and those ketone bodies then like go through the blood and get into the brain. And then they're used mm-hmm. to, to run neurons and things like that. Yes. They, you know, we cannot function without an, you know, an active brain. Um, so these ketone bodies are uh, a way of, of getting the, the required energy to, to, the, to the brain and to the periphery. It's, it's basically an alternative source of source of, of energy. And, and this state, like when, when you are doing this and creating these ketone bodies, that's what they call ketosis. Exactly. Yeah. And you can get to a state of ketosis um, either by consuming ketogenic diet, but you can also get to a stage of ketosis when you are fasting for a long period of time or mm. star- starved, starvation. Um, and these, these ketone bodies are produced by um, fatty acid beta oxidation of, of fats that are coming from the food. And how much does it matter um, what kind of fat? Like, does the keto, is it any kind of fat, saturated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated? Does, does that stuff matter? Yeah, so it, it does matter. In the case of ketogenic diets, um, it's, it is recommended to consume mainly unsaturated fats. Um, and less of the good fats like uh, you know avocado and olive oil, um, but I think that the the main point here is not really what kind of fat you consume, but how much carbohydrates you bring into the system. Mm-hmm. So it's mainly the the low glucose levels that that drive the the formation of ketone bodies. I see, I see. So it's a high fat diet. Maybe doesn't matter so much. What what is critical is that it's low, low sugar, low carb. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And what, how do the, how do the, how much does like protein matter? Like, could you go into a state of ketosis if you were having a high fat, high protein diet that had low carbs? No, I think this is the, um, the diet that is called Atkins diet. It has, it's a different kind of diet that was designed in the seventies for weight loss. Um, and this, Diet also has restriction of carbohydrates, but it doesn't restrict proteins or calories in general. So in this kind of diet, you will not go to a state of ketosis so quickly. So the the main key here is to uh, give a lot of fat, limit protein consumption and reduce carbohydrate consumption. Um, so the, if you look at the fat content in relation to carbohydrates, it's the traditional ketogenic diet is called four to one from a uh, ratio. So you will get 90% of, of your calories from fat, 8% from proteins, and only 2% from carbohydrates. I see. And so if you have too much protein, even if you're doing a high fat, low carb, you won't go into ketosis. Is that because the proteins are getting used to make something other than ketone bodies? Yes. Yes. You can break proteins to make energy. It will be a parallel process. Um, and in when, when you consume ketogenic diet, it is that has limited amount of protein. The major source of energy is fat, will come from fat. Mm-hmm. In, yeah. And- and how, how fast is this process? So let's, let's say that you're eating a traditional Western diet today. And then, you know, you listen to this podcast and you're like, all right, tomorrow I'm going to go on the ketogenic diet. How long will it take your body to make that switch and go into ketosis? Just a few days, a few days. Mm-hmm. And do people like, um, obviously you can measure it physiologically. It has effects in the brain that maybe we'll talk about in a little bit. Can you, do people report that they feel different? Yeah. So I, Personally, I haven't tried um, going on a ketogenic diet. I think it's a, it's a major commitment to make. Uh, but from what I saw, um, you know, you deprive your, your body from sugar. And I think we're all to some level addicted to sugar. So I, I, I assume that the, the first few days are more challenging. You are more tired. I, I saw that people report uh, 
headache and nausea and and generally feeling uh, like flu like symptoms mm. but then your body gets used to it yeah. and and then you know you don't suffer from these yeah. symptoms anymore and that, that sounds like drug withdrawal <laughs> yeah it's I think it's it's really it's like a sugar withdrawal that we yeah. should all <laughs> we should all do um, yeah. interesting okay so Anyways, let's go. Let's go back to your study. So, so we, now we know what ketosis is. We know what the ketogenic diet looks like. You gave these mice this ketogenic diet: high fat, low carb, not so high protein. Uh, it had this anti-tumor effect. What What else did you find? I know that there's some more some more detail there. Yeah. So maybe before we should we uh, we go into more details in this study, which I think we should mentioned that ketogenic diet was tried already in the past uh, by you know many many different groups in different kinds of, of uh, cancer therapy uh, different kinds of, of tumor models and it was shown that in some cases um, it is beneficial but in in other studies it was actually shown to have an opposite result and in mm. in in other cases it was shown to have absolutely no effect so I think that Ketogenic diets can be beneficial to for specific cancer types, but not others. Um, so the the different the effect can be different. Um, and I think that the other point that was made by by other studies is that uh, for every every patient might have different mutations, even if the cancer falls under the the same category. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessary that you know that the one patient will react in a way that will be you know identical to to another patient so you need to take into account the different genetic alterations and and tumor associated syndromes between different individuals um, but what we found in our studies that so this ketogenic diet is protective and we we asked ourselves how can a ketogenic diet be protective in colorectal cancer and we already mentioned that ketogenic diet is inducing the um, production of ketone bodies in our liver. And these ketone bodies are beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. And beta hydroxybutyrate, or BHB, is the main ketone body. And this is actually also the, the main uh, source of this alternative energy. Um, so we we try. We ask ourselves whether one of these ketone bodies is mediating the protective effect of ketogenic diet, and in order to do so, we had um, two parallel approaches. One is to give mice these ketone bodies. So these mice were fed a normal diet, the diet that that mice are fed regularly, and they were given BHB on top of these regular diets. So mm-hmm. they they didn't go on a ketogenic diet at all. And they just eat and it. You can they, just consume it orally. Yeah, you can consume it orally. You can give it in the drinking water. Um, you can you can buy it in a form of of a drink, in a form of different oils. It's available. Um, it's it's not a, a drug. It's a supplement. Um, so it's something that that is uh, very easy to to obtain. Um, and we found that it was enough to give mice BHB, this ketone body in order to prevent and, and treat existing tumors. Um, we, so, so you recapitulated yeah. the results from before just yeah. by giving them BHB, even yeah. though they were having a, a regular diet with carbs in it. Exactly. Yeah. So as long as you, you elevate the levels of BHB, either by ketogenic diet feeding or by giving BHB exogenously from outside, you can have the same beneficial effect. Um, we saw that... In, so we did this, this kind of experiment in mice. We also had, we also used a really cool system, which basically allows us to generate mini guts, mini intestines in the lab. So we can take small pieces of, of, the, uh, of the gut of, of a mouse or of a human patient. And under tightly regulated conditions, we can force these small pieces of tissue to form um, a 3D structure that resembles the, the intestinal epithelium. And we can treat these mini guts in culture in the lab with beta hydroxybutyrate and see a similar response. So in mice, when we induce tumors, 
BHB treatment leads to protection and the mice that are treated with BHB develop less tumors. And when we take this BHB and we give it to these small mini guts, these, these, uh, these 3D structures, they proliferate less. So they are smaller in size. Mm. And this is also something that is you know, beneficial if you're thinking about cancer development, you suppress cellular proliferation. So, so is BHB directly modulating some um, critical part of the cell cycle? Um, so what BHB is a molecule that is studied um, extensively. Um, but what we found is that the beneficial effect of BHB is mediated by the receptor of BHB that is called GPR109A or HCAR. Um, and after BHB binds to its receptor, something is happening inside the cell and it leads to reduced proliferation. Mm -hmm. What we identified is that downstream to this BHB, HCAR and cellular, between this and, and cellular proliferation, there is another gene and this gene is called HOPX. And this gene was previously suggested to be a tumor suppressor in, in different kinds of cancers. So we found that by giving BHB to mice or to intestinal organoids, these mini guts, we can induce the levels of this tumor suppressor, HOPEX. And this is enough to, uh, to protect. So when you, have, when you treat with BHB or with ketogenic diet, if you give it to, hop, to mice that don't have HOPEX, HOPEX deficient mice, they are not protected anymore. So in order to have the protective effect, we have to have GPR109A, the receptor for BHB, and also OPEX. I see. So BHB levels go up either because you take it as a supplement or because mm -hmm. you go into ketosis because of the mm -hmm. ketogenic diet or because you're, you're fasting or something like that. Mm -hmm. The BHB is going to be sensed by receptors in cells of the gut, and then stuff happens to the genome. Genes turn on, genes turn off, and the net result of that is basically less cell division. Exactly. Yep. The cells proliferate less. Um, and if you're thinking about a tumor um, in the gut and you know, the, the cells proliferate less, less then you, the outcome would be a smaller tumor. So the tumors mm -hmm. will be smaller in size. Interesting. And so I mean, so you literally said, so BHB, it's, it's, a, it's a ketone body. Um, it can be used to make energy, obviously. You mm -hmm. can give it to the mice as a supplement. Is this also a human supplement? Like, can you go to the store and buy a bottle of BHB? Yeah, you can buy it on, on Amazon. <laughs> so then you just take it as a health supplement, but your study exactly. just came out. So why was it, what, what, what do people use it for already? So people use it uh, for, um, for different kinds of reasons. So it has this, uh, you know, the uh, people see it as, as something that is overall healthy. Mm -hmm. um, but BHB is is, uh, is used for treatment of, of different uh, different diseases, um, such as different metabolic diseases. Um, I saw that that people take it for uh, for acne, um, different. Um, uh, different neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Hmm. Um, and in yeah. the world, I mean, in, in the world of health supplements and health claims, you know, generally I would be skeptical here, but, yeah. but, you know, we, we, I do want to talk about the effects of the ketogenic diet and BHB on epilepsy, because you mentioned it before, and I know that there's some pretty dramatic effects there. So can you summarize what that is for people and what's going on in the nervous system? Yeah, so I, I think that um, it's not completely clear, the mechanism of action of, of BHB. And I think that this is something that we're lacking, especially in the field of, of dietary supplements. Mm -hmm. um, but so in the case of epilepsy, it was shown that... Uh, so the people got to the to the this observation that that ketogenic diet is is protective because when when kids were put on uh, some kind of starvation protocol, they found that they these kids developed or they had less seizures, and then they they tried to design a diet that will mimic this fasting, 
and they found that you know ketone bodies was were one of the of the parameters in the blood of of these kids that was different. It is thought that that it it can be beneficial in the case of epilepsy um, through different mechanisms. It can change the 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 um, the stimulation of of nerves, the and how the the excitation of of nerves and the the abundance of neurotransmitters. Um, so it can suppress the or reduce the the amount of neurotransmitters. So this is one um, idea, and the other idea is that. If you give BHB or ketogenic diet, you mimic the state that um, was in the developing brain. So by, by, by creating an environment that is more similar to a developing brain environment, you basically enhance or promote the recovery of, of neurons. Um, yeah, I think these, these are the, the main two two suggested mechanisms one is the the effect on on neurotransmitters and and activity of neurons and the other one is is uh repair i see so so a lot of the details are still mysterious but bhbs have dramatic effects in the brain in terms of cellular neurophysiology Mm -hmm. and it seems to be generally the case that when you're in a state of ketosis or bhb levels are high that the sort of uh the the environment of the brain is a little bit more like the developing brain and is conducive Mm -hmm. to uh new neural growth which is basically the opposite of neurodegeneration exactly yeah interesting but but i'm not a brain expert so i what about um what about effects on like immune responses and autoimmunity? Is there any known um, interaction between ketosis yeah. and that? Yeah. So actually, when we when we did our study, we 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 didn't know that, or at the point where we only had the observation that ketogenic diet is protective, we asked ourselves how can a ketogenic diet be protective in the case of colorectal cancer, and there has been several evidence by now that it can affect the immune response by different mechanisms. One is by inhibiting one of these inflammasomes, inflammasome complexes that is called NLRP3 inflammasome. So BHB and ketogenic diet were shown to inhibit this innate platform of, of the NLRP3 inflammasome. It was also shown that ketogenic diet consumption changes the composition of the microbiome uh, and this leads to to different abundances of of uh, immune cells, and as a consequence, different uh, immune responses. But we saw that even though we could observe similar um, similar um, similar results in in our system, so also when we feed my ketogenic diet, they have less uh, inflammatory cytokines. So the NLRP three is inflammasome is important, but it doesn't mediate the protection effect in the case of colorectal cancer. So if you take NLRP3 knockout mice and wild type mice, and you treat both of them with ketogenic diet, and you look at the cancer development, the knockout mice and the wild type mice will both be protected protected when they are fed ketogenic diet. So NLRP3 might be affected by ketogenic diet, but it's not driving the protection in the case of colorectal cancer. It has many different and, and other important functions, but not in mediating a protection from CRC in mice. Uh, the same is true for TNB cells. We used mice that don't have any of these uh, adaptive immune cells. Um, and also their ketogenic diet was protective. So even though these mice are deficient in a very major part of their immune response or immune system, then even though they don't have this part, they can still have the protection that is mediated by ketogenic diet or beta hydroxybutyrate. Mm. So ketogenic diet can change many, many different, you know, many different aspects of our physiology, but it's not these, all these different parameters do not necessarily drive the protection. Mm -hmm. You know, so far the ketogenic diet is, is very popular right now. I mean, a lot of people have at least heard Mm -hmm. of it. A lot of people have tried it so far in our conversation. We've talked about only good things, right? Like ketogenic diet can have this anti-cancer effect sometimes, although sometimes you mm-hmm. did say it is possible to have the opposite. Yeah. It has this anti-epilepsy effect. 
is there are there any downsides here? Is there any reason you know everyone shouldn't just go buy a bottle of BHB and start consuming it? So I think we should make the distinction between ketogenic diet and BHB. Mm. So I think that ketogenic diet was shown to be beneficial or not beneficial depending on on the type of cancer and the context. It was even shown to to enhance the uh, the deficiency of of other kind of of cancer therapies. It was shown that ketogenic diet can enhance the the efficacy of of targeted therapies. Um, if I remember correctly, um, PI three kinase inhibitors. If you give ketogenic diet when you treat with these kind of inhibitors, you make the the treatment more effective. It improves the efficacy of of the classic cancer therapies. In, in some cases, um, this, these kind of diets, they are very, very rich in fat. So you would think that they will induce elevated cholesterol or, you know, negative, um, negative consequences on our general metabolic health. But it was actually shown that it doesn't, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't greatly change the body composition or the different parameters in our blood. And as far as I know, no studies reported um, any severe adverse effects of, of ketogenic diets. Um, so it's as, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't cause any deterioration of, of metabolic markers, not cholesterol, no, not uh, triglycerides. Um, hmm. Yeah. And what about what about BHB supplementation? Is there any reason to be cautious about that? Um, I'm not a physician, so I I cannot say if it you know if there are certain conditions where BHB should not be taken. I I think that if you compare just BHB supplement com- and and you compare it to a whole ketogenic diet, I think that in terms of um, you know how practical it is. I think that drinking a BHB supplement is is much easier than than uh, adhering to this very very strict diet that doesn't have any carbs and basically limits. Uh, it's it's almost an anti-social kind of diet because you cannot go out, yeah. you cannot have alcohol, you cannot you know. Um, so I think that just drinking BHB is something that is is uh, is more realistic. Um, I. I'm not aware of any negative side effects of consumption of, of BHB or these ketone supplements. Um, I saw that you know some of these supplements they can cause some uh, discomfort in in the gastrointestinal tract, but this is something that usually goes away. Um, mm-hmm. I think after a few days. Mm-hmm. Uh, not all supplements taste good, but mm-hmm. you know, other than this, I'm not aware of any major side effects. Yeah, and and I would imagine too there's there's feedback here. Like if you go into a state of ketosis for a pro- prolonged period of time, is that, uh, well, so, so if you were to take, um, if you gave, if you gave mice or humans, but maybe you've done this in mice, if you give them BHB supplementation, but not the full ketogenic diet. So their, their diet doesn't change except mm-hmm. that they've got this BHB supplementation. Does that cause, is that sufficient to cause clear changes in the microbiome composition? So, Ketogenic diet definitely alters microbial composition. In the case of BHB, it's less clear. I um, I'm not sure we even looked at it. You know, mm, I yes, but I I would think that yes, just because BHB can change our um, innate immune system which then can modify and, and affect the composition of our microbiome. So my guess is, yes, mm-hmm. it will change. The other thing I want to ask about is, <clears throat> so obviously our bodies have the capability of switching into these different ketosis. metabolic states, um, ketosis. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, I'm sure there's multiple other ones that I don't even know about, but the fact is we can do it. And if you mm-hmm. think about, um, you know, think about this in evolutionary terms, You know, if you think about wild animals or human hunter gatherers, you know, present Mm -hmm. day or in the past, 
they probably generally lived in environments that were much less uh, stable and plentiful than ours in mm-hmm. terms of uh, food availability. So they had to go through periods of feast and famine. Sometimes food was abundant, sometimes it was scarce. And you didn't have a choice um, as to whether or not you were going to be fasting. It was just sort of a, a part of the natural cycles of life. So, I mean, with that in mind, when we think about sort of the, the natural human ecology that our bodies evolved under, are our bodies sort of like expecting to switch metabolic states at different times and not always be in sort of like one diet, one mode of metabolism? Yes. I think, you know, it, it's exactly what you're saying. We, our body has to have this backup in case we will, you know, we will encounter a, a long period of, of starvation or when, when food will be less available to us, we can, we can, you know, lose weight, but our brains, they, you know, our brain has to have enough energy in order to continue function. And it's not just our brain, it's other organs like, like the heart and our muscles. They not all these peripheral organs can, can uh, get enough energy in the absence of glucose just by consumption of fat. They need, they are relying on this, they rely on these ketone bodies to, to get to them and to allow them to, to get enough energy. Um, yes, I, it's definitely, you know, it's something that is very important from an evolutionary point of view, because you, you know, in the past food availability was much less predictable. What, um, what are some of the things, what are some of the big questions that you guys are working on in the lab now? So I think that in, at least in, in the case of, of the ketogenic diet or BHB, story uh, there are a few few next interesting questions one is whether the microbiome is playing any role in this protection mm-hmm. is something that we are currently addressing so I, I cannot comment about it at the moment hopefully soon the other question is whether you can combine bhb with existing treatments for for different kinds of cancer so we identified one specific mechanism by which ketogenic diet is protective in the case of colorectal cancer. I, I think that it will be interesting to get to this kind of mechanistic understanding of the effect of ketogenic diet or beta-hydroxybutyrate in other cancers. Mm-hmm. Um, we, so most of the work that we, that we have done and that we are currently working on in my lab is based on animal models of, of cancer. Um, we have some evidence that is also included in the paper that was recently published that suggests that a similar phenomenon can also be observed in, in humans. So we found that in colorectal cancer patients, the amount of BHB correlates with uh, these, these different genes that we identified, specifically HOPEX. So when patients have higher BHB, they have higher levels of HOPEX, and they also have um, reduced cellular proliferation. Mm-hmm. We found it by single cell RNA sequencing, and yeah. Oh, I was just going to say this. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a really interesting finding, just beyond beyond your specific results for colon cancer and the ketogenic diet, because it's sort of, at least to me, it's saying, well, if one of the main cellular physiological effects here is to limit cell proliferation. Um, it's very natural to suspect that this isn't going to be limited to the colon. And it also starts to get you thinking about like, okay, if, if the Western diet and the Western lifestyle is having this sort of pro cell proliferation effect, it, it starts to point to a story where like, yeah, maybe, maybe that's exactly why uh, a number of cancers are on the rise and associated with this kind of general lifestyle. Yeah, I think that's, so we, we identify this specific pathway of ketogenic diet, BHB, and, and how it acts inside the cell. I, I wonder if in order to, to observe a, a similar protection in other cancers or even you know, in, in other organs or in, in different cancers along the GI tract, would you need to have the same cellular machinery in order to have the protection? Or let's say you will now observe a protection in... In, you know, in cancer, in a completely different organ, do you need to have the same receptor, the same protective genes in a way in order to have protection or are other genes important in different cells? 
Mm-hmm. So I think that the mechanism can be different between cell types, between different types of, of cancer. Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, I, we currently are in the process of, of um, starting a clinical trial in, in colorectal cancer patients. So we will treat patients with BHB. And we will see if, if we, we can observe uh, something similar, if we see this protection also in, in humans that are treated with VHB and not just in mice. So this, mm-hmm. this is something that is uh, currently an active uh, ongoing clinical trial that hopefully we can get the first results from in the next couple of months. How much, how much BHB do you give to patients? So we give the, the recommended amount. The, the patients will drink uh, BHB drink three times a day. Um, and it's, it's a relatively small volume of approximately 30 ml, 30 milliliters. Yeah. So it's not like a mega dose or something. It's a normal no, no, amount. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Well, this is fascinating stuff. I mean, I think this is an interesting area, just the general, you know, the general idea that diet can have such a physiologically potent, uh, potent effect on us at the level of, you know, preventing disease and, and things that maybe we don't haven't appreciated historically as much as, as much as we are starting to. So I'm definitely looking forward to see, seeing what else comes out of, out of this work from your lab. Thanks. I think it's really, I think it's really exciting. And I think that it will be really interesting to see if we can design diets that will be protective or prevent different kinds of cancers, different kinds of diseases, understanding, you know, what is the mechanism of protection in case we identify such, um, and whether we can design diets that will support existing therapies. The, the therapies, at least in the case of colorectal cancer these days, have major side effects, chemotherapy and surgery. If you could maybe, you know, give patients BHB and, you know, reduce the, the, the chemotherapy or, you know, change the, the amount of chemotherapy they would need to take, you would improve their quality of life significantly. So I think there is a lot of potential of treating with BHB or even other molecules that can be identified that are coming from diet or that are influenced by diet, either as a standalone therapies or in combination of, of existing standard therapies. And it's, again, it's not limited just to, to BHB. It can, you know, the same kind of studies can be performed with different diseases, different diets, uh, different molecules, BHB, different microbial metabolites. I think the, the possibilities here are, are endless. Well, I think that's a, a great spot to end it. Dr. Mayan Levy, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. My pleasure.